imagine it's the fifth of Muharram. You're in your tent and you hear noises and commotion from outside. So you come outside and you see a few people debating things with each other. Some are saying, let's leave. Why are we staying here? If we stay, this is going to happen to us. Others are saying, how can we leave the grandson of the Prophet alone? You become confused, you go back into your tent. The same thing happens on the 6th, 7th, 8th. Finally, on the ninth night, you hear loud noises coming from outside. For the last four nights, you've been debating within yourself whether to leave the camp of Imam Hussain, peace be upon him, or to stay with him, not knowing what's going to happen to you on the tenth day. On the ninth night, the noises get louder, there's more commotion outside. Naturally, you leave your tent to see what's occurring. And you see people leaving the camp of Imam Hussain in their hundreds and thousands. Looking around, bewildered yourself, for a split second, your eyes fall into the face of Imam Hussain, peace be upon him. You see the grief and sorrow and sadness in his eyes and it no longer matters to you that you've spent the five nights debating within yourself am I going to stay or am I going to go seeing that look on his face buys you loyalty and you decide to stay the morning comes it's now the 10th of Muharram, the day of Ashura. Imagine you walk up to the Imam as his companions did and you offer your service to him. But he lets you decide what you'd like to do. So for example, you could go and bring back water with Abul Fadl al-Abbas. You could protect the tents of the women and children from harm. You could tend to the wounded or bring back the severed body parts of his companions. You could fight in his army against the enemy. You could stand shield in front of him in prayer. You could keep the little children busy while their brothers, fathers, uncles go and die. What would you want to do for Imam Hussain on that day? I think it's a question I've asked myself many times uh, throughout my life commemorating this event and I think we need to be honest with ourselves when answering this question. I think in hindsight it's very easy to say I want to do this, I want to do that. But when you truly reflect on what you would have done on that day, sometimes the answer is not very comfortable for you to accept. I could easily say I would do this, I would do that. But sometimes I ask myself, am I even worthy to be in that camp? So before I even answer the question, I don't think I'm good enough to even be um, with Imam at all. I'm not worthy to look him in the face and I'm not worthy to stand alongside him whatsoever. However, as we know, the Imam is generous and if he accepted Hur into his camp, I would like to think if I asked him, he'd accept me into his camp. The people who always fascinated me have been the ones who stood as a human shield while the Imam was praying. The reason they fascinated me and I would like to be them if I had the faith to be them is because if you truly picture it you have an arrow flying towards you and you are volunteering to put your chest or your neck in the way of an arrow 
rather than hitting the Imam while he's praying. And it's easy to say I would do that. But when I truly reflect on if I could do that, I worry that if I see an arrow coming towards me, would I flinch? And if I flinch, will I move out of the way at that last moment? And if I move out of the way, will it hit the Imam? Truly reflecting upon myself, I'm not sure whether I could do that. I would love to be able to do that. But it's not something I feel I'm good enough doing. Because what those people did was heroic. Literally putting your neck or your chest in front of an arrow, which is like a bullet. Again, however, if I could choose to do something, it would not be something specific. It would be something to help the people. Psychologically, someone to talk to, someone to give people hope. We know the Imam at that time would be a very busy person. I would help him, for example, bring the bodies back. Because taking a body 72 times can be quite tiring. However, at the same time, I would be someone, I hope, that is one of the first to be killed. And I'll tell you why, it's because on the 9th of Muharram, when the Imam shut the lights and asked the people to leave, he put the lights back on and everyone stayed. And they said to him, what life is there after you? Why would we leave? So for me, living after Imam Hussein is not an option. And I will not be able to watch what happens to him and to the other companions. It sounds a bit cowardly, but I want to die first, so I don't witness that. Second reason is that there is a narration. Either the Prophet or his father, Imam Ali, told him when he was younger, what's going to happen in the future? He said, you're going to be killed in Karbala. Do you accept it? Imam Hussein said, yes, I accept it. Your brother will be killed. Do you accept it? I accept it. Your son will be killed. Do you accept it? I accept it. Your nephew. He's six months old, do you accept it? And then he was asked, your women will be taken captive. And the Imam paused. And instead of saying, I accept it, he asked a question. He said, is that gonna be after my death or before my death? And the Prophet or Imam Ali said, it'll be after your death. He said, I accept it. So even Imam himself couldn't bear to watch what happened afterwards. So I'd do something that would give some kind of peace and comfort to the people around and something to aid the Imam. And in the end, whatever he asks, I will hopefully do. Now imagine you've had a long day at work. The students you teach have exhausted you. You're hungry, tired, upset, angry. You drive home, you walk through the door, you come inside, and you see members of your family running around the house frantically. One person's making tea, another person's organizing fruit, another person's bringing sweets, another person's making food. In that commotion, you grab someone's hand and you say, what's going on? Have we got guests? Have people come to visit us? And they say, we've got guests and they've come to visit, but not us, they've come to visit you. So you think to yourself, maybe it's someone, a colleague from school or a friend from mosque or a friend from outside or from the community. You come up to the living room, you open the door, you walk inside, you see, Sitting in your living room, on your chair, is Imam Hussein Alayhi In that situation, what would you say to him? What would you want to hear from him? How would it make you feel, having had probably one of the worst mornings of your life, to come home and see him there? We all dream of meeting Imam Hussein. And those lucky enough to go on his pilgrimage have sort of met him in person. I would 
say to him straight away, I'm not worthy for you to be here. In fact, I wouldn't look him in the eye because I'm not good enough to look him in the eye. These eyes that God's given me do not deserve to look at his representatives on earth. I'd go to his feet and when you go on a pilgrimage, you have a list of things in your head you're gonna ask Imam to give you. Every time you go, the list leaves your head and you just say what you feel in your heart. So I'm not gonna ask the Imam for any requests. I just wanna say thank you to him without looking him in the eye. I want to say thank you to him, and I'd say to him that because of you, my life has meaning. I sometimes think to myself, without Imam Hussein in my life, <clears throat> what would my life be? And it's scary when you think about it. Not that I would become an immoral, you know, out of sorts person. But in terms of giving me a direction in my life, there would be nothing without this man in my life. One of the biggest questions a human being can ask is, what's the meaning of life? And I think, as followers of Imam Hussein, the answer is given to us. He is the meaning of life. So I'd say thank you to him for everything he'd done. And I would... I would ask him to recite his tragedy to me. I want to hear it from his own lips, what happened to him. I couldn't take listening to it, but I want to sit down by his feet and listen to what happened to him from his own eyewitness account. Because we know the fifth Imam, his grandson said, if our Shia knew what happened in Karbala, they'd die of grief. His father, the fourth Imam, said, Karbala made us living corpses. So there's so much we don't know about what happened, and I want to hear from him exactly what happened. Coupled with that, I want to ask him how. How did he do that? Because we as human beings, when something small happens in our life, that harms us, disturbs us. Our faith fluctuates. When you look at what Imam Hussein did, not once did his faith fluctuate, it stayed up. Yes, he was a human being who had emotions, who felt sad, but how he kept that air of faith in God is something that will always astound me. Many people ask this question, why does God allow evil in the world? And that question has never bothered me because it's just a, a fact of life. A question that's bothered me my whole life is that how has God allowed 14 innocent people, especially Imam Hussein, suffer when they did nothing wrong? That's the question that's bothered me my whole life. I would ask Imam Hussein that question, is that how did God allow this to happen? Not that I don't doubt God whatsoever, but I want to hear from his own lips how he kept that faith. And that will hopefully inspire me when I, when the meeting ends. At the beginning, I asked you about almost 1400 years ago. And you rightly replied with, with hindsight, it might be easy to say if I was there, I would stop this, or if I was there, I would delay this tragedy from happening, or try to aid this person in this manner. And you finished your answer to the first question, having me told you that Imam Hussain gives you the choice, you said, even if he gave me the choice, I'd still do whatever he advised me to do, because I would want to bring his heart at least some peace on a day where he had his heart broken into a billion pieces. In this day and age, a lot of us forget that we have a 12th Imam. And in a way, at least him being physically absent 
from us gives us a choice in using our own opinion and logic in how we want to serve him so i guess my final question is what have you done for the 12th imam to bring his heart some peace what do you think he deserves from you and how would you take let's say an 11 12 year old boy's hand and introduce him to the 12th imam what do you think is the best way I think first of all, personally speaking, I don't differentiate between the Ahlul Bayt. We have a narration that says the first is Muhammad, the last is Muhammad, and those in between are Muhammad. So for me, serving one Imam, it's as if you're serving the rest of them. However, the question is, is a good one in terms of what would I give to the 12th Imam, what could all I have to offer him? I think there's three things that come to my mind that I personally would like to do. The first two are linked together, the third is a bit separate. The first thing I would like to do is to be an instrument, to be a tool, to be a part of his vision. And we know the vision of the 12th Imam is justice and good manners because that's what Islam is justice and good manners so in my day-to-day -day conduct with my fellow human being whichever background they come from I want to be someone that treats them justly does never never ever oppresses them and has good manners with them I think that's a small step if everyone did automatically the world would be a good place because as we know, in terms of how long I've been alive, I think right now the world is not is in the worst place I've seen it since I've been alive. So I think small things is the way to start. The second thing is, I would say, the most important thing. And it comes linking to a narration by the sixth Imam where he says, bring people towards us with your actions. If you notice, we in the Shia school of thought we don't have stalls and on bus stops and on street corners telling people they're going to go to hell if they don't join us. Because we like to say actions speak louder than words. So I would say that the second thing I would like to do to the Imam, for him rather, is to be a good ambassador for him. So if someone comes across me, they see me, they interact with me, they say to me, who do you follow that makes you like this? And I say, I follow 14 impeccable people. And the last one, I'm waiting for him to return. Because I don't think we realize the power of leaving a good image of our religion in people's head in today's society. If you can have good manners with people, they can see where it's coming from. And that will portray the Imam in a very good way. And conversely, if you oppress a single human being while representing being a Shia Muslim, you've damaged the Imam in a very, very severe way, in my opinion. That's the second way. The third way is recently I came across a narration where it astounded me. And it said that when the 12th Imam returns, what's he going to say first to the people? So he announces it's him. What's his first words? Now, when any president gives their first speech, king, queen, ruler, whoever it might be, gives their first speech, everyone's watching. And we focus on their first sentence because that sets the agenda of who they are. And according to some narrations, the Imam says, oh mankind, or oh universe rather, my grandfather was killed oppressed, my grandfather was killed thirsty. These are the first words that the Imam is going to give to us after over a thousand years. That to me shows that the whole purpose of him coming back is to, as we say on a Friday, investigate the blood of Karbala. He's made it so important to the universe to tell them, my grandfather was killed thirsty and oppressed. 
that gives me a message and that says to me that I must do the same. I must tell people what happened to Imam Hussein in Karbala. Not to convert people, not to show off, not for PR, because that's the least we owe Imam Hussein, that the world knows what happened to him. And I can guarantee as a byproduct, by people learning about what happened to this man, the world will wake up. Because Imam Hussein didn't die to save us as such. That's not an ideology as such. He died to wake us up. And I think the 12th Imam wants us to ensure that his grandfather's memory will never ever go in vain. So I would do something, ensure, in whatever capacity I feel, that Imam Hussein's story is told to people. And I believe this can be done in any walk of life whatsoever. You can wear a turban and go in a pulpit and do it. You can be a street sweeper and do it. You can be a CEO and do it. Every walk of life you're in, I believe, whichever job you have, you can tell people about Imam Hussein. It will do you no harm whatsoever. So those are the three things I'd give to my Imam if he accepts. And how would you introduce an 11 or 12 year old to the 12th Imam? I think every religion or non-religion has this view that the world's not good enough right now. It needs, it needs to be saved. Whether you're a Christian waiting for the second coming of Christ, whether you're the Jewish faith waiting for the Messiah to come, whether you're one of us waiting for the 12th Imam to come, or a Sunni Muslim waiting for the Mahdi to come, we all have this core belief that there are going to be people who will make it all better in the end. I never portray the 12th Imam as a religious figure because that's off-putting straight away in the society we live in. He's a man of principle. As I said before, he's a man of justice and good manners. I would tell an 11, 12 year old that one day a man will come and if you're just a good human being who is just, who has good manners, he'll make you go far and he'll help you. He'll put his hand over your head and guide you. That in itself is attractive because I think an alternative to the current world we live in right now, the 12th Imam is that alternative that we have. He's the hope that we have. And again, as we have in our own theology, every Friday, every day even, we wait for his coming and we pray for his coming. And if you have this man in your head that one day he will come, psychologically, you can keep going. Every day might be difficult, but you know there's an end point coming. And the 12th Imam, as we call him ourselves, is the relief. He's the relief. So I'd introduce him as a figure who is universal, not as a Muslim only, as a Shia only. I think that's wrong. He's a universal figure for every human being. He's the Imam of all mankind, not just uh, us. أين بقية الله؟ أين بقية الله؟ أين بقية الله؟ على كراز خداي خدا كلاد كبيا خدا سنور غير نوايب خدا کند جمعیان خدا کند